the social contract. The, uh, the progress that we made in those post-war uh, decades, you know, the 50s, 60s, and 70s, uh, it sort of sounds like an oldies, goldies radio station in a way, right? The greatest economic policies of the 50s, 60s, and 70s come from that we were able to demand and win a better share of the pie and steady increases in our standard of living. It came from full employment conditions coming out of the war, especially in reaction to the Depression. Uh, you had very vibrant labor markets where basically if you wanted a job, you could get a job. And if you got fired from one job, you could walk down the street and get another job. And that actually gave workers a, a tremendous amount of underlying power. The private business sector was very profitable, very dynamic, uh, very expansionary. You had all kinds of investment coming into Canada. Business investment was very strong. Productivity was growing. Jobs were being created. Labor laws were favorable at the time to unionization. We had the RAND formula, of course, uh, card check uh, certification. So unions grew. Uh, the growing public sector, uh, social programs that were underpinning all of that. Um, you also had, I think, some very big political issues. For example, in the post-war era, the legitimacy of capitalism, in essence, was still in doubt, especially in Europe and other parts of the world. Employers and, and sort of the political establishment were worried about that alternative. So all of those things came together. Workers had very high expectations and they had uh, the ability to put some of those expectations into practice. Uh, one measure, this is the share of GDP that's captured by workers in terms of wages and salaries. There's other ways you could show the, the rise and fall of it. In the golden age, uh, the share was rising through the 50s, 60s and 70s again and reached a peak. And then uh, afterwards, of course, the, what we'll talk about later, uh, under what we now call neoliberalism, the share was declining. And where did we get the power to win a larger share? We got it because we had power. Here's just one example of it. Uh, the frequency of strikes in Canada, which also rose during the 50s, 60s, and 70s, which showed that workers were willing to organize and use their power for a, a better deal. And of course, that has been falling since. And you could find other, in other indicators of the rise and fall of workers' power. Uh, but ultimately, it was our ability to press employers into treating us better and press governments into treating us better that allowed us to make uh, that progress in that period. L'Allemagne est un bel exemple d'économie extrêmement ouverte, mais où on a mis en place des politiques sociales, des, des modes d'organisation des travailleurs et travailleuses qui permettent euh, de réagir à la compétitivité mondiale et, et, et d'avoir une dynamique haute. Donc, ce n'est pas, pas une équation euh, mondialisation mauvaise. Euh, égal mauvais pour l'ensemble des travailleurs et travailleuses, mais ça, ça signifie qu'il faut adapter nos politiques et nos façons de faire dans le milieu, euh, milieu syndical. Je suis part de cette conversation, mais peux-je juste dire que je ne veux pas revenir à la fin des 50s et 60s, je veux revenir à 100 ans, parce qu'on a un 100 ans de itch que nous sommes tous en train de scratch à travers le monde. 100 ans ago, c'était la birth de international women's movement, et it came out of the internationalist solidarity movement. We were scratching an itch for greater equality, men and women, workers all over the world. Why? Because there was growing globalization then. There was the growing power of the elite, of corporations, of rich people. It was an era of robber barons, great exploitation, and, brothers and sisters, great opportunity. People were moving from city from country to city, looking for job opportunities, all sorts of things was happening. We are at the same place now in the expanding global supply chain conditions and better supports. This is happening on the other side of the world. Here we're starting to lose ground and wondering how we're going to hang on to what we've got. But if you start thinking about what it was that led to the birth of the world that we live in, it wasn't so much only that there were angry people that wanted more. In fact, Canadians and people all around the world wanted more from their employers in the teens, in the 20s, in the 30s. They didn't get it till after the war. And they didn't get it till after the war in North America because employers suddenly, you know, employers resisted giving more back then. Why did we get it in the post-war period? Well, we got it in the post-war period because there was no competition for North, North American employers. Really, North American employers, Canada and U.S., was the only game in town in terms of globalization. Lower wages and uh, uh, lower working conditions, even there, they have destroyed those economies, which has led to a flight of people who have skills to try and come north to find uh, employment and opportunities here. So we have that pressure coming because of the process of globalization, but also uh, because uh, the uh, economies in many countries in the south 
have actually been adversely impacted by globalization and by the project of the International Monetary Fund.